Well, hi there. This is a vampire squid. It's not a squid. Unless this is a squid. And this is a squid. And actually, every cephalopod alive today is a squid. Except for this one. But this one is alive today. Even though that came as quite a surprise to me when I first saw one in a zoo. Because I thought they'd gone extinct at the end of the Cretaceous. But they didn't. These did. And these are more closely related to these than these. But there are still some cephalopods with shells. In fact, almost all of them, even if you can't see them. Some are very well known. Some are less well known. And some you probably have never seen before. Some had never been seen alive by anybody until recently. One of those is the largest invertebrate in the world. And the other is a giant squid. Some glow in the dark. Many can change colors, even though they don't see in color. And some can even change their textures. Some you can see right through. They have incredibly complex eyes, and they're shockingly intelligent. And at least one species is so venomous and intelligent that it can easily beat a great white shark in a fight. I, I read once in a terrible book. But the big picture is that cephalopods are diverse, mysterious, interesting, and often poorly understood. That and there may or may not be such a thing as a squid. So it seems to me that we need to dive into this group and see if we can learn more in one video about cephalopods than you have in your entire life leading up to this. Today's video is sponsored by Magic Spoon, who, as you know, makes some of my favorite cereals on the planet. We've had many a great taste off over the, well, last year or so. But today we're exploring a game changer in the world of snacks, Magic Spoon cereal bars. Imagine that you want all the flavor and the low carbs, high protein of some of your favorite Magic Spoon cereals, but uh, you're on the go. Well, guess what they've got for you? With only one gram of sugar and 11 grams of protein, these bars are setting a new standard for guilt-free indulgence. Their latest flavors, double chocolate and blueberry muffin, are not just a treat for your taste buds, but also a guilt-free choice for any time of day. Whether you're looking for a morning boost, a post-workout snack, or a late-night treat, Magic Spoon's got you covered. What's even more exciting is how Magic Spoon is revolutionizing the way we think about snacking or eating on the go. Gluten-free, grain-free, and with keto-friendly options, they cater to a wide range of preferences. And the best part? They're committed to quality and transparency using only the best ingredients. Magic Spoon is offering a special deal right now. Use the link below or scan the QR code to get $5 off your first order with my exclusive code, CLINT. Choose your favorite flavors and create a custom box that suits your taste. With Magic Spoon's 100% happiness guarantee, there's no risk in trying something new and great news. They're not just available in the US. Our friends in Canada and the UK can enjoy them too. Now let's talk about some cephalopods. So, what is a cephalopod? Well, they're mollusks, like snails, slugs, clams, oysters, chitons, and such. Which is a fact that is almost as surprising as if I said that they were aliens from another planet. That almost seems more believable. But they do have a ton in common with their less head-like relatives. Cephalopod means head foot, for the record. And two of the main similarities shared by almost all, if not all, mollusks is the presence of a mantle cavity and two pairs of parallel nerve cords instead of a single main nerve cord like you see in chordates, like you. And for the record, you are not closely related to cephalopods at all, despite the fact that you both have a head and feet and complex camera-style eyes. You are more closely related to a starfish. You're welcome. Mantle means cloak or cape, and it is the dorsalmost surface of the body in many mollusks. It really does look kind of like a cape on a slug. It's much harder to see in shelled mollusks because the mantle cavity in all mollusks secretes a shell or at least calcareous spicules or plates, something like that. This means that it is usually contained within the shell for mollusks with an external shell. And whether or not you can see it from the outside, the mantle is extremely important for mollusks, especially cephalopods. Like all mollusks with gills, the gills are housed within the mantle in a special cavity called 
the mantle cavity, and it houses both the respiratory organs as well as a lot of their other organs. The anus and genitals both terminate in the mantle cavity. This is all normal mollusk stuff. But cephalopod mantles have an extra power because they also serve as a major source of propulsive energy. They're like jet-powered bagpipes. You may or may not be familiar with how bagpipes work, but I assume that learning how they do was a major reason that you chose to watch a video about cephalopods. So I'll get right to it. Bagpipes are a bag. Air gets into the bag through a tube called a blowpipe. A bagpipe player blows air into the blowpipe, hence the name blowpipe. It's a pipe where you blow. Blowpipe. That's how you keep the bag full. Interestingly, your lungs are also a bag. They also have a pipe for filling, but they use the same pipe for unfilling. Not so for a bagpipe. The blowpipe is for filling only. Air leaves through a bunch of other pipes called drones and a canter. To make air exit rapidly, the bagpipe player squeezes the bagpipe between their arm and body. Well, that's pretty much exactly how a cephalopod works. Except cephalopods do not have drones. So they are basically just a bag with a blowpipe and a canter. In this case, the bag is the mantle. The blowpipe, where water enters the mantle cavity, is called the mantle aperture. Since there is no kilted Scotsman to blow water into the mantle aperture, it must be pulled in by expanding the mantle itself. More similar to the way that the Scotsman's lungs function than the way that a bagpipe functions. But possible because the mantle is highly muscular and can expand itself. So the bag expands itself, pulling water into the mantle aperture blowpipe, which is, in this case, more of a suck pipe. Water is then pulled across the gills, countercurrent to the flow of blood through the gills, maximizing efficiency, just like in birds. Because, like the lungs of birds, that I still need to explain in a future video, air, or in this case water, does flow in a direction. It doesn't just sit in a bag like is the case with your lungs. After oxygen has been extracted from the water and CO2, as well as all bodily wastes in the case of mollusks, has been deposited into the water, it is expelled through the octopus equivalent of the canter, the siphon. But the siphon is better in some ways than a canter. For one thing, have you ever heard a rest in a bagpipe song? Nope. Now why? Because the canter is always open. Well, the siphon, on the other hand, is quite muscular itself and can be closed completely when the cephalopod is inhaling as can the mantle aperture when the cephalopod is done exhaling, so that all of the water brought in during mantle expansion passes over the gills, and all of the water expelled during mantle contraction passes out of the siphon. And the siphon can also change to vector the thrust in different directions, like a F-35B. This means that water can be fired out of the siphon and used for both propulsion and steering, allowing rapid, high-speed acceleration like this to be possible. But speed, in many cases, is not the most dangerous weapon in their arsenals. Because you don't need to be fast if nobody knew you were there. This is squid skin. Most cephalopods possess skin somewhat like this, and this is an octopus. Don't, don't you see it? Gosh, it's right there. There. Isn't that nuts? Let's watch it backwards and in slow motion. And of course, camouflage is not the only way that you could use such capabilities. You could use it to mesmerize your prey. Or you could change color to communicate with other cephalopods. Or to look like something that you're not. No matter how you use it, the ability to change color and texture is always incredible and in some ways, relatively simple. Their skin is covered in chromatophores, which are essentially bags of pigment that can be expanded by contracting muscles around them, and then snap back into a tiny space when the muscles relax. Different muscles control different chromatophores, allowing the cephalopod to control its color. And it can do this both voluntarily and involuntarily, sort of like how you breathe. Of course, you already know how they breathe. But how do they change texture? There are many animals that can change color, but the ability to change texture like this is unique to the cephalopods. But interestingly, the skin papillae responsible for the change in texture function in a way that is remarkably similar to the function of the arms, as 
muscular hydrostats, like your tongue. This is a muscular structure with no skeletal support or hydraulic reservoir stored in a separate compartment in the body. It is the muscle itself, which is mostly composed of water, and is thus incompressible by forces that could possibly be exerted by muscular action. This means that if you contract the muscles in your tongue, instead of crushing the tongue, it will simply cause it to change shape, but not volume. Skin papillae involve rings of muscles, as well as muscles that reach across the rings, that can contract, resulting in a mountain-like bump on the skin. And while we're on the subject of muscular hydrostats, let's talk about three more. Arms, tentacles, and suckers. Many cephalopods have all three of these things. But you might not know the difference between those first two. Cephalopods, as we will soon discuss, are broken up into three main groups. And those three groups can each be identified by their number of arms and tentacles, which aren't exactly the same thing. Both are muscular hydrostats derived from the molluscan foot. But the big difference between arms and tentacles is how much they suck. If they suck all the way, their arms. You can remember this because I have a good friend who shall remain nameless, and he sucks on his mother's arms all the way to her armpits. He wouldn't do this if she had tentacles, I assume. But tentacles only suck part way, if at all, in that arms have suckers all the way down on the side closest to the mouth. Tentacles don't, though they may have some suckers, or none at all, as is the case for the members of the clade Nautilidae. They have suckerless tentacles, around 50 of them, sometimes far more than that, which is a lot more than we're going to find in the other two main cephalopod clades, five times more than the most arms and tentacles that you will find among any of the remaining cephalopods. And yet, you can probably recognize a nautilus without even seeing its tentacles, because they are also the only extant cephalopods with an external shell. I'm being very careful about how I put that, because most of the cephalopods have a shell, just not an external shell. And that spiral-shaped external shell makes nautilids very easy to distinguish from the other extant cephalopods. Though, as was the case for me as a child, it is very easy to confuse them with another lineage of cephalopods that was very successful until the end of the Cretaceous, and that we'll discuss here in a minute. But we have so much more to discuss about nautilids first, because having an external shell and 50 suckerless tentacles is only where they begin to be weird. And that is weird for cephalopods, and they all seem like space aliens. But the shell, as is typical for mollusks, is secreted by the mantle. Much like the shells of gastropods, like snails, their shell forms a spiral that gets larger as it approaches the opening. Though some ancient nautiloids had straight shells. Unlike snails, however, the shell is symmetrical. Cephalopods do not undergo torsion. We'll have to talk about torsion whenever we discuss snails. It's really interesting, but it doesn't result in snails pooping on their own heads, as we have sometimes been informed. Anyway, the shell is symmetrical, spiral-shaped, and full of chambers divided by structures called septa. Pay attention to those septa. They're going to be very important in distinguishing nautilids from their shelled extinct cousins. But those septa are concave and follow the same basic curve as the opening of the shell. The chambers, despite the septa, are not entirely isolated. They're connected by a long strand of tissue called a siphuncle. And I think for most of my life, I have misunderstood what the siphuncle does. I knew that it helped nautilids maintain neutral buoyancy, similar to the function of a, the swim bladder in bony fishes. But I always thought of it as a tube that transported gases into and out of the chambers. I also incorrectly thought that nautilids were the only extant cephalopods with chambered shells connected by siphuncles. Turns out I was wrong about nautilids being the only ones, and I was wrong about how it works as well though it is essential for maintaining anything approaching neutral buoyancy. I'll talk about the other groups that have chambered intersiphuncal chambers when we get to them. But right now, I want to talk about what the siphuncle actually does, and how it does it, since it isn't a tube. As a nautilus grows, it grows new chambers, and it lives in the ocean, so those chambers are full of water. 
And if they remain full of water, the Nautilus would get very heavy and would probably sink, which is not good. The siphuncle is not a tube, but it does contain some tubes, blood vessels, a structure that most mollusks lack. The Nautilus greatly increases the salinity of the blood flowing through the siphuncle. This causes water to move from the chambers into the blood via osmosis. Simultaneously, gases in the blood, such as oxygen, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen, diffuse from the blood into the new chamber. And this allows them to maintain a density near that of the surrounding water. That said, this mechanism is not rapid and subsequently cannot be used to move up and down in the water column rapidly. That still needs to be done by jet propulsion. Unlike many of the other modern cephalopods, natilids do not have the ability to change color or texture. And one of the biggest differences is that natilids have fairly simple eyes, which is unusual because cephalopods generally have very complex camera style eyes. They are very much like the complex camera style eyes of vertebrates, but arguably even better as they do not have the blind spot typical of vertebrate eyes like yours. And they function a bit more like a camera by moving the lens to focus the eye as opposed to changing the shape of the lens as you do. But the reason that I bring this up now is because natilids do not have them. And by them, I mean camera style eyes, not eyes at all. They totally have eyes. What they don't have are lenses. Charles Darwin in On the Origin of Species wrote, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Like any good scientific theory, there must be some means of falsifying it if it is false. And Darwin, right in his most notable work, laying out the strengths of his theory of evolution by means of natural selection, laid out one spectacular way to falsify his theory. A complex structure that could not possibly be reduced down to a series of steps, each of which providing a benefit to the organisms that possess them. A structure that could only provide benefit at or near its current level of complexity. And probably the most commonly cited example of such a structure by those that oppose biological evolution is that of the camera style eye. Many have claimed that the camera style eye is irreducibly complex and undermines Darwin's theory completely. But does it? And what do we learn from Natilids about the subject? Well, if we look at the camera style eyes of most cephalopods, we would see multiple very important structures working together to communicate visual information to the brain. Let's start with the photoreceptive cells located at the back of the eye. This is called the retina. And these photoreceptive cells convert light energy into electrical energy that can be transmitted to the brain via the optic nerve. Those cells sit at the back of what is essentially a pot, a nearly complete sphere with a hole at the front that allows in light. And that light is focused onto the photoreceptive cells through a clear round lens that can move forward and backward like the lens of a camera or a telescope to improve the resolution of the object being examined. A highly complex structure that would not function as well if any of these structures were missing. But notice that I didn't say that it wouldn't function at all. Heck, I mean, just communicating to the brain that the animal is in darkness or light would convey a clear benefit. There is value in knowing if you are hidden or exposed, whether you're in the shallows or the deep, whether it is day or night, and how long the day and night each last. Any nerves near the surface of an animal that gets stimulated when exposed to light would achieve this goal. And there are still plenty of organisms alive today that have such um, eyes. Heck, I mean, the whole bodies of snails are covered in um, eyes like these. If those light-sensitive photoreceptor cells only become stimulated by specific wavelengths of light, and an organism has two or more types of these wavelength-specific cells, then it would even get some information about the color as well as the amount of light present. Sort of like this white plate. If this white plate were photoreceptor cells, and I turned on my flashlight, well, it would communicate to the organism that there's more light or less light but not the directionality of the light. I would only be able to know what direction the light came from if I had photoreceptors like this on multiple sides of my body. And this is what you tend to see on organisms with such eyes like, well, snails that we mentioned earlier or jellyfish. But if those light sensitive cells are located on the surface of a pit, the shape of a 
a bowl, like this bowl, then a single patch of photoreceptors can collect information not only about the presence or absence of light, not only about the intensity of the light, not only the color of the light, but the direction from which the light is coming, which is very valuable for locating and reacting to other objects in your environment. Many living organisms, including mollusks like limpets and chitons, have cup-shaped eyes just like this, and they're doing great. But they can't see images clearly at all. The light bouncing off of any object enters the cup from many slightly different angles. This is a bank of enclosure. They're well illuminated and this room is otherwise dark. Most of the light present in the room right now is being emitted by what is reflecting off of these enclosures. But you'll notice if I look at my plate or my bowl, I don't see an image of the enclosures. I just see mm, some light relatively uniform all over them. And the reason for this is because when light bounces off of an object, it spreads out, it refracts in many different directions. And so from every point on that enclosure, the light is heading off in a whole bunch of different directions and hitting the plate, and I'm just getting a bunch of noise. With my plate, it's just light. With my bowl, well, it's light with direction. And that's all I get. That is, unless I shrink down the amount of light that I allow to hit the plate or the bowl to a single point. By doing so, I only get the light from a very small number of refracted angles. The smaller the hole, the fewer the angles. If there is light bouncing off of an object on the right side of my bowl, it will pass through the pinhole and hit a small region on the left side of my bowl. Light travels in straight lines unless it is refracted by an object. Now, instead of getting that light from all of the angles that is refracted by this object, for every point on the object, I get a single point of light on my bowl, but on the opposite side of my bowl. Light coming from the left side hits the right side of the bowl. Light coming from the right hits the left side. From the top hits the bottom. From the bottom hits the top. And for each reflective part of an object, I get a corresponding point of information projected upside down and backwards onto my bowl or onto my plate. Suddenly, I have a somewhat high resolution image of the object reflecting the light projected onto my bowl. It isn't just light or dark. It isn't just intensity. It isn't just general directionality, but it is an image. This is how a camera obscura or a pinhole camera works. Okay, so that's how a pinhole camera works, but I'll be honest, like, seems a little bit hard to believe that you're actually going to end up with an image just because you constrict down the aperture to a single pinhole. So I had to make one, and I had to make one in a way that we could also observe the image on the inside. If you put a piece of film back there, that's one way to do it, but I came up with another way. So here's what I built. I, I, I didn't want to buy anything new. So what did I have? I had, a, I had some trays from some Panda Express. I had a box, some electrical tape, and some Clint's Reptile Room shirts, which are stinking rad. Okay, and what I did is I, I, I took a piece of paper. These are our photoreceptive cells, right? It'd be even better if it's a bowl because then we get directionality, but it's gonna be a little easier right now if I just use a piece of paper. So there's a piece of white paper back there. I taped up the box so that all of the, well, the only place that light will be coming in will be through this hole. Now I've put, I, I drilled a large hole here, and then I also put on a small card so I could change the size of this pinhole because I wanted to learn what happens when I change the size of the pinhole. And then I put also another large hole here, which actually, destroys this as a pinhole camera, unless you're looking in the hole. If you are looking in the hole, or if you have a camera pointed in the hole, then suddenly it becomes a pinhole camera and we can see what's going on inside. But the first thing I need to do is I need to install this here in the front and I need to make sure that no light is gonna get around it. That's what the shirts are for. So let's get building. Just like that. We're ready to see what this looks like through a pinhole camera. All right, so we've got most of the lights off here in the room so that this bookshelf reptile enclosure is the most illuminated thing around. This is one of the things for a pinhole camera that's really gonna matter is that your object 
is brighter than the surroundings. And so this is, this is what it looks like from our camera. Here's our camera. And now as I approach the camera, what you're going to see is we're going to cover that hole and you will be able to see what is being projected on the paper. Are you ready? Let's see here. Wow. We've increased the size of our aperture, which is this hole here to a little bit bigger. This is still our viewing hole. And so now we will see what the image looks like if we expand the size of the aperture just a little bit to not quite so much of a pinhole. And you notice that? We've got an image, it's brighter this time, but a little bit blurrier, because the less of a pinhole we have, the more extraneous light that it lets in, the blurrier the image, but the brighter the image. But what we do have is an image, not just light or dark, not just direction of the light, but an actual picture. Okay, so we have already seen that the larger the hole, the brighter the image, but the blurrier the image. And if I made the hole like the size of my fist so that I could see it really clearly, we had to use special settings on our cameras in order to be able to see that image at all because it is so dim in there. But if I opened it up really wide, it would let in so much light interference that I wouldn't have an image at all. However, if I introduce a lens into the equation, it changes everything. Watch this. I'll open up my aperture all the way. Obviously, I get a crisper image if I close it a little bit, but I'm now gonna introduce a lens into the equation. And if I get the distance just right, I can get a highly focused image. Even with my aperture open wide. It's still upside down, it's still inverted, but it's an actual image. And if I, and by moving the lens back and forth, that's how I bring it into focus. Well, this is also how the eye of the Nautilus works. It is essentially a bowl-shaped pinhole camera. And like all of the other simpler versions of eyes, it works. But like you probably noticed, when I used the bigger hole, more light came through, but it also allowed in more angles of extraneous light. So my image got brighter, but it became less crisp, blurrier. So if you notice, the pupil of an Attilid is pretty much always really small. They can't let in much light because the image that they will see will become extremely low resolution if they do. But if I put a lens between the hole and the bowl or the plate, and get the distance just right, I can focus the image. And when it comes to visual acuity, placing a lens between the pinhole and the photoreceptors would result in a much better eye. An eye that could dilate much wider, allowing much more light without losing resolution. And that is the type of eye that we see in the remaining cephalopods, the clade Coleoidea. And possibly the other well-known group of externally shelled cephalopods, the ammonites. And they likely had arms and tentacles more in the numbers that you would find on a squid than on a modern nautilus. And I specify modern nautilus because if we include the ancient nautiloids, the nautiloidea becomes much less meaningful. Because it appears that the ammonites and the coleoidea all emerged from within the nautiloidea. Modern nautiluses of the family Nautilidae form a monophyletic group. But all of the extant cephalopods and the ammonites all seem to fall into the nautiloidea. Many extinct nautiloids are more closely related to ammonites and coleoids than they are to nautilids. But ammonites can be distinguished from other nautiloids by the direction of their septa. Remember the septa? The little dividers between the chambers of the shell? Well, in ammonites like this one, they bowed towards the opening of the shell. Where in other shelled nautiloids, including the nautilids, 
they bow away from the opening of the shell. Ammonites went extinct following the events that caused the extinction event at the end of the Cretaceous that we covered in this video. But their diversity hit its peak during the Triassic. They were basically the pseudosuchians of cephalopods. But interestingly, they were more closely related to squids than they were to natilids. And speaking of squid, or squids, as the word squid has two accepted plural forms in English, what are they? What are squids? Are they even a thing? To figure this out, we will need to take a look at the closest living relatives of the ammonites, the lens-having, arm-bearing, sucker-sporting, external shell-lacking nautiloids of the clade Colloidea, which has, nested within it, two large clades, the Octopodiformes and the Decapodiformes, the 8-foot forms and the 10-foot forms. And they are differentiated by their number of sucker-sporting muscular hydrostats. Eight? or 10. Let's start with eight. Eight foot form coleoids have eight arms and no tentacles. You remember the difference between arms and tentacles. This group includes one clade of octopuses and one clade of squids. The octopoda, octopodes, and the vampyromorphidia, vampire squid. Let's start with octopi because they are more familiar than vampire squid and will help us better understand vampire squid if we talk about them first. For starters, the word octopus has three accepted plurals, all of which I have been careful to use in every video where we discuss octopodes, except for a video about keeping pet octopuses, in which I used none of the accepted plurals. I seem to upset more people by using all three than by using none, but uh, I don't intend to stop anytime soon. So octopi it is until the next time I need to refer to more than one octopus. Why don't you keep track of which one I use the most to see if I have a subconscious favorite. But octopuses, like all octopodiforms, have eight arms sporting suckers all the way down on the mouth side. The mouth, as is typical for cephalopods, is a chitinous beak. A beak which, in the case of octopodes, is the main feature that determines the size of a hole through which they can pass their shellless or nearly shellless bodies. But one of their most defining features are their brains. Octopodes and cuttlefishes have the largest brains relative to their body size of any invertebrates on the planet. And in the case of octopi, that is only a ninth of the story. The brain, which is protected by a cartilaginous capsule, is clearly very important. These are really smart animals. But two thirds of their total neurons are in their arms. In essence, the arms have their own brains. There is a hierarchy and the central brain can take control when coordinated action is required. But each arm can also do its own processing and react appropriately to many stimuli without having to run it by the big guy between the eyes. Not only do octopuses essentially have multiple brains, but they have multiple hearts two to pump blood to the gills, and one to pump blood around the body. This is normal for cephalopods, but as we mentioned earlier, the fact that their blood flows through blood vessels at all is unusual for a mollusk. I would also argue that you effectively have multiple hearts, but we'll talk about that another day. But unlike you, cephalopods have blood called hemolymph that is blue when oxygenated, and that's due to copper-containing compounds found therein called hemocyanin. Hemocyanin exists outside of blood cells, just out in the hemolymph, and it can function at a much greater range of temperatures than is the case for the hemoglobin that we use. It's fancy stuff. Speaking of fancy stuff, let's talk about ink. Unlike the nautilids, coleoids produce ink as a defensive weapon and smokescreen. I mean, you make all of the ingredients, unless you have some form of albinism, but it's just mucus and melanin. But a key component of melanin, tyrosinase, which you might recognize from T-positive and T-negative albinism, the T is tyrosinase, well with that it can do more than just obscure the water visually, but likely chemically as well. And tyrosinase is toxic in high concentrations, even to the octopus itself, which is something you need to be careful about if you keep cephalopods as pets. We definitely need to make a full phylogeny video just about octopodes. I want to say thank you to our patrons at Patreon who made this video and actually all of Phylogeny February possible for us. These videos take a lot of time and effort to produce and we wouldn't be able to do it without your support. So thank you so very much. And if you want to see a video say about all of the octopodes, or all of the octopuses, or all of the octopi in the near future, uh, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Well, right now we need to discuss the hagfish of octopuses, vampire squid of the clade Vampyromorphida, which are not vampires. 
They're primarily detritivores. I want to suck your bones and other decomposing tissues that you aren't using anymore. So they're not vampires, and I would argue that they aren't squid either. Though they could be. I'll make that argument too. In fact, I'll start to make it right now. Vampire squid look basically like octopi. They have webbed arms and flappy head wings, but so do many deep sea octopodes. But all of the other octopodiforms are more closely related to one another than they are to the one living vampire squid. Vampyrotuthus infernalis, which literally means vampire squid from hell. That would be a cool name even for a tyrannosaurid. But the octopodiforms are also closer to one another than they are to any of the extinct vampire squids. Vampyrotuthus infernalis is a living fossil the last remaining member of a once much larger clade of uh, squids? Octopuses? Maybe neither? Both? Uh, one, one of those things. They can be distinguished from other octopodiforms by the fact that their arms only have suckers near the ends, like tentacles. But they aren't naked closer to the mouth like tentacles. Instead, they have spiky looking projections called cirri. And while they don't have true tentacles, they have some weird as heck retractile filaments that they can fire out from little pockets that can extend to many times the length of the body of, you know, this squid octopus, both neither creature. They don't have many chromatophores, and they don't have much use for them either, living in the deep ocean, but they do have photophores, which allow them to light up, which I would argue is even cooler. So they're super cool, much different from octopodes, but more closely related to octopodes than they are to anything else called a squid. Which means that either vampire squid are not squids, or octopi are also squids, and maybe not just them. Though it is totally up to you if you want to consider all octopodiforms to be octopuses. Vampire squid are the hagfish of octopodes. But if they are squids, what else would need to be squids as well? Well, all of the decapodiformes, or none of them. You could just kick out all of the decapodiformes and the octopi, and uh, the vampire squid could become the only true squid on Earth, if you want to play that kind of squid game. But I don't think you're that kind of monster. So let's find out what decapodiformes are, and who all of these other squids would be if the vampire squids are to keep their names. Well, decapodiformes have 10 large muscular hydrostats. Eight arms and two long feeding tentacles with suckers only at the ends. Similar in function, but not evolutionary origin or structure to the retractile filaments of their vampire squid cousins. The decapodiform most distantly related to all of the other extant decapodiforms is the clade Spirulida, represented today by another living fossil, the ram's horn squid. So, a squid. And with a shell in the shape of, um, you guessed it, a ram's horn. So far, so good. Three clades of potential squids, and two of them are already called squids. This is going fairly well. Of course, only two extant species of over 300 species that we've covered so far in this hypothetical squid clade, but uh, who's counting? Squids or not, ram's horn squids are cool. And yes, they light up, which makes nothing less cool. Admit it. If you found out that T-Rex could bioluminesce, that would make that bad boy even cooler. Their shell looks and functions much like that of the Nutellids, but it is contained within the mantle. Which isn't really all that surprising, as all extant cephalopods are nautiloids, just in case you forgot. But if vampire squid are squids, then not only are octopuses squids, but so are these, the ram's horn squids. And these, the members of the clade Sepieda, the cuttlefish. Which, along with octopi and nutellids, are cephalopods that I have never heard anyone call squids. Uh, except for me. Today. But if vampire squids are squids, then so are cuttlefish. And even if vampire squids are not, but if ram's horn squids are squids, cuttlefish still need to be squids. You can't have either of the squids we have discussed so far be squids without including the cuttlefish. They have to be squids. And, and why not? 
They are way more squid-like than either of these squids that we have discussed to this point. Not just phylogenetically, but morphologically as well. Though they are the only rivals of the octopuses for brain-to-body ratio among all non-vertebrate animals. And like octopodes, they have incredible ability to change both their color and texture. But one way that they are quite different, in addition to having two tentacles, is that they can't fit through tiny spaces very well. Because like ram's horn squids, cuttlefish, which aren't fish and don't cuddle, have a large chambered internal shell, which can be used to regulate buoyancy via a siphuncle. Remember, it's a nautiloid. It's actually weird not to be able to do this. Good for buoyancy, but bad for fitting into tiny holes. Lots of lensed cephalopods have unusually shaped pupils, but the W-shaped pupils of the cuttlefish, those might just take the cake. And that weird pupil allows them to see clearly in front of them and behind them at the same time. Almost like two eyes in one. In addition to the typical arms, tentacles, and jet propulsion available to decapodiformes generally, they also have a fringe-like fin around the mantle that they undulate in a wave-like motion to propel themselves forward and backwards. Kind of like the flap ears of vampire squids and mini octopi, but they move more like the legs of a millipede. And that gets us to the final clade of things called squids. This would be actually the third clade of things that we generally call squids. And unless we include at least a few cephalopods that we usually don't call squids, then these would be your true squids, with the other two being imposter squids. Squid posters, if you will. This octopus and cuttlefish-free true squid clade is made up of five major groups divided into two primary clades. One with two smaller clades of tiny squids, and the other with three clades, which include the giant squids and the squid that's even bigger than that. Let's dive into the tiny clade of tiny squids first and save the biggest for last. The tiny clade of tiny squids includes the sepiolida, also known as bobtail squids, and the idiosepida, the smallest of all extant cephalopods, known as pygmy squids. Bobtail squid have a rounder mantle, like a cuttlefish, but with a shorter yet similar fringe. Unlike cuttlefish, they do not have a chambered shell of any kind, but they do have a big light on their mantle that turns them into the Christmas light of the sea. And they reproduce more than once, like nautilids, which are very long-lived, but unlike the bulk of cephalopods, which reproduce only once and die after a surprisingly short lifespan. But despite reproducing multiple times like nautilids, they're still fairly short-lived, and they're tiny. One to eight centimeters. So at most, just a touch over three inches long. Tiny. But not as tiny as their closest relatives, the aptly named pygmy squids. I don't know of any pygmy squids that get over an inch long. They're adorable. They're shaped more like traditional squids, like a torpedo with two little flappers at the end of the mantle farthest from the eyes, arms, and tentacles. They look like squids, just pygmy. Pygmy squids. And that gets us to the three major clades of big squids, including the biggest squids of all. These three clades being the Myopsida, Bathytuthida, and the Ogopsida. Now, not all of them are big. Some members of the Myopsida, for example, are less than an inch long, though others are closer to three feet. Not huge, but bigger than what we've been discussing. But all three of these groups have greatly reduced shells, resulting in a small stiffening rod. Many have great color-changing abilities, but not much when it comes to skin texture. They have sacrificed most of the benefits of a shell in exchange for speed. These larger squids are the speed demons of the molluscan world. And some of them are the titans of the molluscan world. Like this, the Humboldt squid. It's as big as a person. It is one of the largest members of the Ogopsida, but not the largest. This one is even larger. A true giant. The giant squid. Hunted by my favorite whale, the sperm whale. Giant squids can grow to be 12 to 13 meters long. That's like 39 to 43 feet, though most of that is just tentacles. The mantle, however, is still longer than most professional basketball players, and their eyes are just a touch larger than a standard NBA basketball. They live in the deep ocean, and the first adult was not observed alive until 2002. Before that, we only knew them from dead specimens, marks on sperm whales, and the stomach contents of sperm whales. But dead sperm whales also taught us about something even more terrifying. That said, only the biggest male sperm whales had this particular story to tell. Giant squids have arms 
and tentacles with suction cups lined with sharp, chitinous teeth. They suck and they dig in. It's brutal. But not nearly as brutal as what they were finding embedded in the flesh of these colossal dead sperm whales. These largest of all macro predators were riddled with giant hooks ripped off in their skin during some terrifying deep sea battle in the waters around Antarctica. Clues to the origins of these titanous hooks were also found in their stomachs. Beaks. Beaks from some cephalopod noticeably larger than the largest giant squids. A true colossal squid. Since these original clues, we have discovered that these colossal squids with swiveling three-pointed hooks in place of suckers are not only slightly longer than giant squids, but they are much heavier, weighing in the neighborhood of 500 kilos, well over a thousand pounds. Some beaks found in sperm whales suggest that they get far larger than that, with the largest eyes of any animal ever known to exist, having a diameter over 11 inches, and they glow in the dark, allowing them to see in pitch black darkness. Now that's a squid. And now you know. As always, like and subscribe, and we hope to see you real soon. Train. <laughs> Typical train. How do you feel about eating caviar? Not caviar. Caviar, uh, calamari? Calamari, yeah. Don't like it. I've never liked eating cephalopods. Because of their intelligence? Uh -huh. yeah. And because they're rad. Yeah. I, 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 uh, my, my standards, as we have discussed previously on a Patreon video, my standards are not consistent, really, and they're not necessarily logical, but there are some animals that I deem too cool to eat.